All right. Uh, so next speaker is Trent on RetroPie. Ten minutes start. Okay. So um, my purpose today is not to actually talk you through the installation of RetroPie because I figure most of you can probably do that on your own, but. What I'd really like to highlight is some of the personal pitfalls I've had trying to get the thing going. But uh, in brief, uh, RetroPie is an emulator package. Uh, it sits on top of a Raspbian distro. Um, you guys will know what that means. I have a vague idea. Uh, it runs dozens of classic consoles and microcomputers. Um, uh, the controller input is unified through uh, another front end uh, called RetroArch. Uh, the basic upshot of that is if you, you plug in a joystick once, configure it, and you don't have to worry about it for any of the emulators in the package that operate through RetroArch. And then the whole thing is again run on the top level, the user level, through, uh, oh, good grief. I'll learn eventually. Uh, the whole thing is run across the top uh, via emulation station. So essentially, get back there. Go. Put. Ah, blah, 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 blah. ah. So basically, it's a front end for a front end for a front end. So why would I do this to myself? Uh, well, it seemed like a good way to actually get emulation deployed to my television set. Um, I have any number of emulators that I could run on my home computer. That requires sitting in front of my computer. I want to sit on my sofa to play my old games. Um, and at the time, I was feeling a little bit obsessed with the Commodore 64, the VIC-20, and the ColecoVision. This is way easier and much cheaper than actually trying to get those systems working. Uh, so that was the decision I went with. And I mentioned this in passing to Scott, and he said, you should do it. So I did. So right off the bat, I learned some rough hardware lessons. Uh, first things first, there is a distribution that works for the Pi 1. Uh, it's not great. Uh, the functionality is there, but the power isn't. Also, the Pi 1 doesn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, the basic upshot of that is that unless you're somehow operating it over a network, you're going to have to shuttle your ROMs back and forth via USB key. This caused us no end of consternation because I had a USB key that was causing the whole thing to short. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 3 has extra graphics power, so it can handle things like the Super Nintendo without any trouble. Uh, and it has the Wi-Fi, which makes things so much easier. Uh, other things. Uh, High-speed micro SD card, just so that it loads really quick, is a, is a good plus. A good quality power supply and USB cable. This is something that I didn't realize until I started using this particular Pi. Um, all of the uh, USB cables in my house were providing just a little bit too little voltage, which would cause RetroPi to display uh, a little lightning bolt icon in the upper right corner telling me, hey dumbass, you've got low voltage. Um, I eventually borrowed a USB cable from my roommate because he bought a whole batch of them from Anchor at some point, and that seemed to fix the problem. So next up, ROMs. Um, I personally had a very old collection of ROMs lying around and didn't think I really needed to go searching. That proved to be a mistake. Uh, a lot of my old ROMs were actually either early dumps or were so old they were still in 8.3 file name format. Um, so searching for new ones, uh, I discovered muparadise.me has almost all of the ROMs that you could ever really need and probably more than you would ever want, but it, it too comes with a few issues. Um, now I'm a madman, so I downloaded complete ROM sets for various emulators, including the Super Nintendo, the Turbo Graphics, the Genesis, what have you, uh, and was kind of distressed when I tried to run some of them from zip files, only to discover that I had, say, Sonic the Hedgehog with Blood Red Skies and Amy instead of Sonic. So yeah, it, uh, it turns out that when you run a zipped ROM uh, in RetroPie, it will run the first file it finds in that zip file, and the MU Paradise ROMs contain every known dump of a ROM 
in a given zip file. So uh, every single hack, every single bad dump that's been circulating around the net, I don't know why they put those in there, uh, every country version is going to be in the same zip file. So, what, so if you're going to go the MU, the MU Paradise route, uh, I recommend looking for ROMs that have W or U. That means that they're World or USA versions. Uh, and a, an exclamation point in square brackets means it's a verified good dump. So those are the ones you'll want to use. For the Commodore 64, it's a little different. Uh, MU Paradise mostly has .tape images, which are not great. Um, C64.com has disk images for most of their games, but most of their disk images have built-in cheats and uh, demos. So those are kind of cool. There's one here uh, on the screen. They show off what the computer can do, and they're sort of irritating because you have to get through them to actually get to your game. Setting up the Pi is easy. You burn the image to a micro SD card. Uh, you plug in a USB joystick, and uh, it'll automatically prompt you to configure it in MU Station. Um, Emulation Station will detect new ROMs as you add them to the ROM directories. You just have to restart Emulation Station, and it will populate. And if it's for a system that has not previously had ROMs in its directory, it will automatically add that system to the list of stuff you can run. Uh, NES, Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, popular systems, run pretty much straight out of the box. Uh, no real setup required. Uh, you can even run a scraper, which I've got a picture of here, uh, which, will scan the, uh, which will scan a games database and get you box art and descriptions for the games. Pro tip, don't leave this running overnight like I did, or you're going to end up with some very, very strange automatically picked uh, scrapes. Where am I here? Ah. So, setting up can also be really frigging annoying. Older consoles, like the Atari, have stupid buttons and switches on the console. Uh, old microcomputers are going to require a keyboard. And any system that isn't supported through RetroArch is going to require you to download an experimental package and do an extensive amount of setup. And of course, the three systems I was trying to run, the VIC, the 64, and the ColecoVision, don't have a RetroArch config. C64 uses Vice, and ColecoVision uses something written by a kid called CoolCV. CoolCV is, in, is a pain in the butt on its own. Um, the Windows version has GUI functions that do not work in the Pi version. Uh, and con configuring the controller for a ColecoVision is a nightmare because the thing has two buttons and a 12-button control pad. Uh, even modern controllers, you will be hard-pressed to find that much space, much less remember where all those buttons are. Uh, the configuration has to be done manually via Nano. Oh. And uh, your config fire file is stored in the home directory, which is kind of rude. Vice is a whole other problem. Uh, the GUI is there, but it's very counterintuitive. Plus, it automatically assigns buttons to your controller whether you want it to or not. Uh, I discovered that my controller had mapped the fire button to X and had mapped the hotkey map button to B. So anytime I hit B, it assumes that I want to map a hotkey for whatever option is currently highlighted. That's super handy, except I can't change it. Uh, and it always seems to get reset when I boot. Uh, furthermore, most of your ROMs are in tape or disk format, hence the emulator almost always boots in warp mode. Meaning, once the game is loaded, you have to get out of the game, back into the GUI, to turn off warp mode, otherwise it's playing at quadruple speed. Um, I've found that the easiest way to deal with, the, with it is to use a uh, keyboard for the GUI, because trying to use the built-in controller mapping stinks. On top of that, cool CV, yeah. On top of that, CoolCV and Vice both have the same bug where my particular joystick uh, needs to be remapped into analog mode for the gamepad to actually work. And I do not know how to handle disk swapping for larger games and can't get the VIC-20 working yet at all because nobody seems to have dumped ROMs in a format that this thing accepts. Finally, uh, is it worth it? Uh, yes, 
I've spent a lot of time complaining about the two systems I couldn't get working, but there are a whole ton of other systems that work just fine. Um, I'll finish. OK. Um, I'm able to play some games that were never released in North America. I've, the picture in the here, two of the pictures here are from Akumojo uh, Dracula X Rinno Chino Rene, which is a Castlevania game never released in North America that's actually really hard to find and thoroughly awesome. And I managed to get it working after a lot of editing and messing around. Um, I can play Impossible Mission on my television, so that's cool. And my primary goal has been achieved. I have a highly portable, couch deployable emulation system that I can take pretty with me pretty much anywhere I go and play a nice relaxing game of whatever. So that's it. Um, I've gone over time, so I will be taking no questions. Thank you. <laughs>